So summary, putting everything together, suppose you have a Boolean function f, and you can compute it classically, with good old regular code, efficiently. Then, uh, what happens if you use this paradigm, this uh, Hadamard transform? It's some kind of Fourier transform, by the way. Transform algorithm or paradigm. Well, what does it do? Like, you first take this classical code for computing f, you convert it to quantum code, a la lecture six or something. Moreover, it's one bit output, so you convert it to like the form if f then minus. Then you do like all these quantum instructions where you first prepare the uniform superposition. Then you do if f then minus. And then you get all the plus or minus one truth table of f like loaded into the two to the n amplitudes of your n qubits. Then you do the Hadamard transform. You do average and deviation on all the qubits. And now you get a new state where the two to the n amplitudes uh, these two to the n numbers like encode some interesting things. They encode all the possible, well, they encode the correlation between your function f and every possible bit masked XOR function. Uh, so then if you do this Hadamard transform paradigm and extract all, what do you see? You, uh, okay, well, uh, let's say let's a quantum computer efficiently uh, see a string b1, b2, dot, 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 bn with probability. Well, it's the square of the final amplitude, so it's like the square of the correlation of f with XOR sub B1, BN. So, okay, so if you do all this stuff and you finally press go on your quantum computer, it will spit out a random string. And the probability it spits out this particular string is the square of this correlation. And so you can do this multiple times if you want. And you'll probably see the strings for which this probability is high. And for what strings is this probability high? It's the strings B such that F has either large positive or large negative correlation with this bit masked XOR function. So with the whole paradigm, what do you learn? You come to learn which bit masked XOR functions are strongly correlated or strongly anti-correlated with the truth table of F. And you're like, this is the magic of quantum computing, you know? Like, wow, what a, what a strange thing to learn. So, yeah, the question is like, what is this good for? What is this good for? So what do we use this for? We basically um, used it for a couple of things. Used it for a couple of things. Um, we use it for, like, mystery toggles problem. How do we use this? Like here, this was like the case where f, somehow you knew, was precisely itself like some XOR function for some like mystery string b1 through bn. And in that case, you're like, oh, great, this paradigm, <laughs> if for some reason I don't know what this string is, but I do have code that somehow does uh, this XOR function, then this paradigm uh, has the property that uh, the correlation of f with like the one secret XOR function is 1, so you just see that string with probability 100%. Okay. And then this other thing, we're talking about bias busting. Um... This was the case where f is anything, uh, but um, we're, we're interested 
in the correlation of f with x or sub 0, 0, 0. Right? Because this is the biasness of the function. So we took any f and we like run this algorithm and like the probability that we see all zeros is like the square of the correlation uh, oh sorry, it's like the square of kind of the bias of the function. In particular, the probability of seeing all zeros is zero if the function is unbiased, and it's not zero if the function is biased. To be honest, uh, neither of these applications are really that cool. This one kind of sucks because although, like, you know, understanding the bias of uh, a function f is mildly interesting, it was practically useless because, you know, it might bust the bias function f only with exponentially small probability. So practically, it wasn't good for anything. This one also has some downsides. First of all, it's like an extremely unrealistic scenario because, first of all, what is this weird scenario where you have some code that you're sure for sure, like, computes like an if XOR then toggle function, but somehow you don't know what that bit string ma bit mask is. And you're like, I gotta figure it out, and I can't just do it by looking at the code. Moreover, it's also not even that cool either, because you know the, the coolness of this was that like the quantum algorithm could resolve it and discover this B by like one call to mystery toggles. And you were like, oh, if you didn't have quantum, you would have to make n calls to mystery toggles to figure out this bit string. So it seems like if n is a million, like, oh, that's a million calls to mystery toggles versus one call to mystery toggles. Seems like a big savings. But actually, there's some overhead, right? Like, I mean, the algorithm for detective toggles, like, it does, like, it has to create a million qubits and has to do, like, Hadamard instruction on, like, a million times, even two million times. So even the quantum algorithm has to do, like, order n work. And the classical algorithm, yeah, it has to call mystery toggles n times, so it does, like, order n squared work. So it's like, okay, the classical algorithm is quadratic time, the, qu the quantum algorithm is like linear time. That's good, but like it's not like amazing or anything. Eh, so what is this good for? Well, I'll tell you next time since we're out of time. Uh, it ultimately inspired, this paradigm ultimately inspired the quantum algorithm for efficiently factoring, you know, million digit numbers. And that's what, event what we'll eventually get to by the end of the course. So, like, back in 1993, in Montreal, uh, there was this guy called Dan Simon. He was a postdoc. He just finished, got his PhD from a very fine school, the University of Toronto. And uh, he was, uh, like, a cryptographer. But his supervisor at Montreal was this guy, Gilles Brassard, who's kind of into quantum. He's one of the first people to really get into quantum computing. And he told Simon, like, you know, look into this quantum computing thing. And Simon, like, you know, looked into it, and he got the impression that it wasn't good for anything. And he's like, I'm going to try to prove that this quantum stuff is not really good for anything. Whenever you have, like, a quantum algorithm, you can have, like, a classical algorithm. That's, like, maybe more or less as efficient. You know, qu quadratic time, linear time, okay, that's fine. Uh, and he worked on it, and he couldn't do it. He invented, eventually, he's like, he boiled it down to, like, a problem. Um, where he had like a super efficient quantum algorithm and he couldn't, the best classical uh, algorithm he could think of was exponential time. And he's like, I'm stuck. So he's like, uh, this is my problem. Well, he didn't call it Simon's problem. Everybody calls it Simon's problem, but like maybe we could also call it mystery period. It's this bizarre problem. So like mystery toggles, it's like a bizarre, uh, you know, uh, contrived problem that would never arise in real life. But like, if you just accept this problem, let's take a look at it. So it's a very similar scenario. You imagine you're given classical code computing some Boolean function f, but now it has n inputs and n outputs. And you have the code, um, but there's a mystery to it. Somehow you know that it has this extremely special property, which you might call periodicity. So the extremely special property is there's some mystery bit string, b1 through bn, which you don't know, such that like if you have a uh, f of x1 through xn, for any input x1 through xn, if you XOR the input string x with this mystery bit string b, then f will output the same values. Uh, and moreover, like, this is the only two times when f outputs the same values, when they differ in, uh, by an XORing of this mystery string. So somehow you like, know that the function has this property, yet you don't know what this mystery bit string is, and you want to discover this mystery bit string. This is an extremely contrived problem that could never like arise in real life. Um, 
But he's like, you know, the fastest quantum or classical algorithm I can think of for solving this problem takes exponential time, like exponential time. But this, you know, Fourier sampling paradigm that we saw, this Hadmore transform paradigm that we saw, solves this problem with like uh, quadratic time. Like you basically need to make um, n calls to if uh, f then toggle, blah blah blah, in order to solve this. And he's like, hmm, this is like even better than the mystery toggles thing because it's like quantum polynomial time versus classical exponential time. Uh, but then I think people were still like, you know, this, this quantum stuff, what are they talking about? I, it's, it's, it's wacky stuff. So that was that. But there's the next part to this story, which is that this guy, uh, Shore, Peter Shore, who prior to this like worked on like computational geometry and like online algorithms, uh, he read Simon's paper <coughs> and he's like, this gives me an idea. Like, this sounds like a bizarre problem, but he was like, okay. Uh, this Hadamard transform, which is like the key, like, quantum thing uh, in Simon's problem, it's like some kind of Fourier transform. It's like a Fourier transform, like, for bit strings, for bit strings and XORs. But he's like, there's like a more well-known Fourier transform, like the usual discrete Fourier transform that probably you heard about in some other course, uh, which is kind of like the Fourier transform for, like, regular old numbers mod in. And he's like, you know, quantum is extremely good at doing this Hadamard transform, it's just and Hadamard instructions. Like maybe it could also be very efficient at doing this uh, discrete Fourier transform. And he figured out that it could. I mean, it's not as simple as just doing Hadamard to each qubit, but he figured out how to um, do the discrete Fourier transform on like the two to the n amplitudes of an n qubit state. And because of that, by following, you know, Simon's recipe, he showed that, like, quantum code could really efficiently solve, like, um, this mystery period function, but where, like, this uh, f didn't operate on bit strings, but it operated on, like, integers. And, like, this operation of XORing in a bit string was the operation of just adding numbers mod n. So, like, he solved the analogous problem, but for, like, periodic functions, like, on the integers mod n, finding the, the period b. And that still seems like an extremely, you know, abstruse problem. But he also realized that um, it was already known to, like, computer science theorists that if you could solve this mystery period problem uh, over the integers rather than over bit strings, then you could um, factor, you would have an efficient factoring algorithm. Factoring, you know, n bit numbers, like, efficiently, quantumly. And, um, you know, in other words, like, if you wanted to th factor a number that was, like, a thousand digits long, you could do it with, like, some, I don't know, million or maybe a billion steps on a quantum computer. Whereas the fastest algorithm, classical algorithm that we know for factoring a thousand digit number takes, like, more time than the age of the universe. and um, before this, people were really happy about the fact that it took more time than the age of the universe because they're like, oh, factoring is an extremely, extremely difficult computational problem, so we can use it as a basis of cryptography. Like, uh, we can, you know, have our code set up so that the only way to crack them would be as if you could factor, like, these thousand-digit numbers, but that takes longer than the age of the universe, so we're safe. And then, you know, sure, by this recipe, that was, like, really based on uh, Simon's uh, use of the Hadamard Fourier transform, uh, showed how a quantum computer, if built, could do it with like just a few million or billion instructions. So that was pretty awesome. And that's, you know, basically the thing that got the whole world really excited about quantum computing. Because finally we had like a problem that not only seemed to get like an exponential speed up from quantum algorithms, but like it's a problem we actually cared about as opposed to like some extraordinarily contrived one. And uh, yeah, this will eventually build up to in the course, like how this factoring algorithm works. But we're not going to do Shor's algorithm uh, because there's this other person called Kateyev, uh, Alexei Kateyev, and he was working in like Russia in 1995. He's like a famous physicist, and he he heard about 
the existence of Shor's algorithm. Like he heard that like this guy Shor like knew how to get a, a efficient quantum algorithm for factoring, but he didn't know how Shor did it. So he's like, I'll just figure it out myself. So he figured it out, but he actually figured out a different way to do it. So he gave a, like a, a different uh, such algorithm. Um, now, actually, if you really think about it for a long time, like super carefully, you actually realize that these are the same algorithm when it finally comes down to it. But like mentally, you don't think of it this way. They like seem like very different approaches and like use different ideas. And indeed, like his approach used a new kind of quantum algorithmic paradigm that he invented called phase estimation. Um, phase is like a term that physicists use to mean complex number of length one. Uh, but we're not going to talk about complex numbers in this course. So um, what is a complex number really except a rotation? So uh, in this course, we're going to study this paradigm, but uh, we're going to call it rotation estimation. But it's basically the same thing. Um, right, so this is like another quantum algorithmic idea or, or paradigm. And uh, he used it to also give like an efficient factoring algorithm. And this is actually the route we're going to take in this course. We're going to first learn about phase estimation, and then we'll use it to um, solve factoring. And maybe this is at least these days in terms of like literally today's present research in quantum algorithms for classical problems. Maybe this phase estimation like paradigm is like the most studied or most active area of research. So that's cool. Um, right, but we're going to build up to this um, over the rest of the course. And it'll, you know, mentioning it also lets me mention another um, important result in quantum computing, which is basically like the one other famous uh, quantum algorithm due to Grover from 1996. And the way I think about it is like this is like a 1.42 to the n time quantum algorithm for SAT. Okay, so maybe you remember from 251 or what else, whatever, SAT is like this most famous like NP-complete problem, and uh, we believe it takes, everybody kind of believes it takes like 2 to the n time, like it takes brute force, there's nothing you can do other than like basically try all inputs. And it seems to take 2 to the n time, and uh, Grover gave this astonishing result, this is really square root 2. Uh, he gave an algorithm that's like square root 2 to the n time. Now, some people are like, ah, this is not too cool, because this is still an exponential algorithm, and this is, uh, in fact, it's not even more than a quadratic speed up, because like the square of this is 2 to the n, which is the brute force running time. But um, you should really think this is awesome, because, you know, this is like the most famous NP-complete problem. We literally don't know any algorithm for it better than just like literal brute search. And he gave this like completely, you know, new algorithm that does, you could say, exponentially better. Like, it's better by a factor of 1.4 to the n. So that's great. And uh, this algorithm is like a little bit um, geometric, in fact. And actually, shortly after that it came out, uh, some people, including like Cleve, Eckert, uh, Machiavello, and Mosca, kind of noticed that you can really think of Grover's algorithm as fitting into or coming from this rotation estimation paradigm as well. So in fact, uh, this is what the next part of the course will be about. Um, it's going to be about the geometric viewpoint on quantum algorithms. And in some sense, we're going to spend you know, like a couple weeks thinking about geometry, and then we're going to learn about this rotation estimation paradigm. That's going to let us do Grover's algorithm. And then finally, that's going to let us do like the factoring algorithm via Kataya's method. All right, so that's the, that's the plan for the rest of the course, pretty much. <laughs> I'm a writer.